Apple is often considered cutting edge, ahead of the game, but I just got back from my local Apple store with a $1,000 charge applied to my credit card, and everything that I bought is ancient and crappy and bizarre. Why do they still sell some of this stuff? Let me show you what I got. And what better place to start than with one of the oldest things that Apple still sells in the Apple store, the USB Super Drive. So in 2008, Apple launched the original MacBook Air. It had this grandiose unveiling that you probably remember. Steve Jobs pulled it from a manila envelope. It was an incredible demo. And frankly, a bit ahead of its time. I mean, the MacBook Air was kind of largely a failure until the 2010 redesign. Uh, part of that was thermals. Part of that was the generalized form factor. But a big part of it was that in order to fit it inside that amazingly small envelope, they had to ditch the disk drive, which in 2008 was still a pretty bold move. So Apple needed some way to offer some sort of CD or DVD support. Now, somewhat futuristic and what they talked about at the keynote was something still available in Mac OS X today, remote disk, which allowed you to use a separate Mac or PC's disk drive and then access the contents of the disk remotely over the network via Wi-Fi on your MacBook Air. It was kind of cool, but the reality is people that were working with lots of disks just opted to use Apple's USB Super Drive instead. This thing, oh, this thing has been in its package lane so long <laughs> I just ripped the tab clean off. This is actually quite a throwback. I mean, look at the gray Apple logo and all of this old stuff. They've still got plastic on this, which has not been a thing in Apple packaging for quite some time now. Look at this, you even have like a textured pull tab. That's crazy. So there we go. Launched at $79 and this thing is still $79. It has been unchanged literally since 2008. It's made out of aluminum, looks very, very handsome. But other than that, I mean, there's, there's not much to it. There's a uh, little rubber pad here on the bottom so that it doesn't slip around. It's of course slot loading rather than tray loading. And wow, look at this. There's a USB-A port in general, but it's got this wrapped connector that doesn't want to come off. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you see, the single USB-A port was and continues to be a problem. You see, with pretty much every external disk drive that has shipped before and since this thing, it shipped with two USB-A headers because the power draw required to spin up a disk and then power moving laser typically draws more than the five watts, which is typically the maximum supported. But since Apple makes both the computer and the drive, they can do some power management magic to make this thing work and allow the drive to draw more. And well, it kind of worked. I mean, famously, this thing did not work with hubs and docks and displays because it broke typical convention of USB behavior, but it always worked plugged directly into a Mac until Apple forgot about it. On my Mac Studio's USB-A port, a brand new computer from Apple that's supposed to handle, presumably, an accessory still sold in the Apple Store, it errors out, saying that it has insufficient power to calibrate the laser. And then, when I go in Mac OS X to dismiss that dialog window, it just blanks out entirely. <laughs> I figured that these issues were probably just Mac OS itself having issues burning all recordable media, because honestly, who's doing that nowadays? But no. Because I went to Best Buy, bought some cheapo Blu-ray drive, and it works perfectly without any software or drivers. Better than Apple's own super drive that's slow and doesn't support Blu-ray, yada yada. This thing hasn't been a good value for years. And now that it doesn't support Blu-ray and it's legitimately broken on most Apple Silicon Macs, it's time to just kill it, Apple. Get rid of it. This is literally the oldest SKU that they carry in the Apple store. 16 years without an update. And it shows. It's a piece of crap. This next one is literally insane. I've been doing YouTube for 15 years, okay? But I took a two year break living overseas away from technology. And when I returned, I spent some cold hard cash that my YouTube channel had earned in my absence to buy a, wait for it, 2013 Mac Pro. What a mistake. Uh, the trash can hasn't been available for sale for seven years now. Parts and accessories for the trash can haven't been available for six years. And yet, still, today you can buy this in stores, the Mac Pro Security Lock Adapter. Look at this thing. This thing is so old, the plastic has yellowed. There's no sunlight in Apple stores, so this thing has just been slowly wilting away on a shelf. And I'm going to open it now. It's $49, and I seriously don't know if I can open this. It's like, oh my goodness, it's like welded shut. There we go. Oh, <laughs> there it is.
it is. $50 for this little chunk of metal. It's got a pull tab. Oh yeah, there we go. And there it is, this little nugget. What is this and how does this work? Well, let me show you. This is my 2013 Trash Can Mac Pro. One of the cool design elements that you might not remember is that you could slide this lock over and unveil the computer. You could open it up. And that's obviously a problem if you're a school or a business that wants to prevent people from A, fiddling with the machine, or B, stealing it altogether. And so this thing is literally a security lock. I've never used one of these, so I don't know how it works. There you go. Maybe. Oh, that's kind of sketchy. Oh, that sound. Oh, that sounds bad. Okay, you slide that into the fan inlet. Oh, oh, this doesn't sound like I should be, oh, I didn't lock it down all the way. It's not, hmm. Oh, there we go. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness, that is difficult to do. Okay, it's on. And then what you would do is take a Kensington compatible lock. You just stick it in there, you twist it to lock it into place. And then nobody can open the machine anymore because it's locked into place. And uh, then you could also tie it down to a desk or a table so that nobody would steal it. Why? Why does this still A, even exist and B, be actively sold in stores. It doesn't, the metal doesn't even match. Like this is like aluminum and they kind of tried to make it like a little space gray, but it doesn't match the beautiful Darth Vader look of the trash can. Why? What is this? Apple doesn't make a toothbrush, but if they did, it'd be this. This is the Lifen Wave, today's sponsor. And look at this packaging. Uh, needless to say, I think heavy inspiration has been borrowed from Apple. And that's not even just in the packaging, which, Look at this, these pole tabs, it's identical. This is so premium, the box is beautiful. Let's pull the lid off. Oh yeah, look, look at this. This is like, this is Johnny Ive, he made this. Look at that, beautiful re recycled packaging. It literally is, there's a symbol right there. Okay, <laughs> I mean, look at this. I have to admit, I already unboxed one of these two months ago. I've been using this toothbrush for a while now, but doing this again, just makes me giggle. Like I'm surprised there's not stickers in here. This is exactly the same. And look at this. This is where your toothbrush heads are located. That is beautiful and premium and recycled. And look at this, this cable packaging. Not only is this cable packaging literally like exactly the same as that. Look at this. Um, okay, they used adhesive there, which Apple wouldn't do that. But the cable braiding is like identical. And the connector, this looks like MagSafe, like literally the same. Look at this. <laughs> ah. Okay. So as mentioned, I've been using this toothbrush for a couple of months and it has replaced my very expensive Sonicare. Not only does it ultrasonically vibrate equally, if not a little bit harder, which basically no ultrasonic toothbrushes on the market do, that's why I've stuck with the Philips so long, but it also oscillates, check this out, up to 60 degrees. I push the power button. <laughs> it vibrates, but also oscillates, which means you don't have to move it up and down. These bristles are soft tapered. They're very easy on your gums. And this button is amazing. So I have mine. This one is mine. It's um, It's been dropped a couple times, so it's seen better days. But it's got this pressure sensitive button. Not capacitive, pressure sensitive. And when I say not capacitive, that means that when your fingers are wet, it'll still work. Like, <laughs> that's metal. Check this out. I don't know how they do it because the thing is completely unibody. There's no gaps, no holes, and that's one of my favorite features. There's no schmoo. On most toothbrushes, you know this little gap here and you get all that nasty little crusty, it's so gross, and you have to pull the head off and clean. No, this thing is tapered such that water gets in there and it just completely pulls it away. I haven't cleaned this base forever. Oh, I love it, okay? There is an iPhone app on this thing that lets you choose the intensity of the cleaning modes and what cleaning mode you'd like to select. There are three that are pre-programmable. And most importantly, these heads are not a scam. Unlike, 
other toothbrushes on the market. You get three of these for just 10 bucks. And if you want six of them, you can get them for as little as 17. It's $79 for the ABS version. Um, this thing is a great value. The performance of this, I think, is equal to the nicest Sonic hairbrushes on the market. The battery, again, I haven't charged this. I mean, it's low now, but I haven't charged this in over two months. And when you need to, you just plug it in via MagSafe <laughs> for two hours and you're good to go for many, many months more. It comes in plastic, it comes in aluminum, and it comes in, of course, stainless steel for $99. It is incredible value. It is a beautiful toothbrush and it literally makes Johnny Ive weep. This is probably my favorite accessory sold in stores because basically only three iPad Pro SKUs ever supported it. This is the lightning to USB 3 camera adapter. Apple and camera adapters have been a thing for like a very long time, actually going back to the dawn of the iPod. Okay, this thing is cool. The idea was that you could plug in cameras and other USB accessories that would ingest data into the Photos app. Um, originally, it was a kind of USB 2, very small looking dongle. I think I have some one somewhere. I'll put it if I can find it. They actually still sell the original adapter today and they sell the similar SD card adapter. You take your camera, you plug it in, ingest the photos in your photos app or into your iPod and you're done. But when the iPad Pro shipped in 2016 and the Files app in 2017, it was clear that more speed, more power and more compatibility was needed. So this thing was released. And despite being named camera adapter, that's selling it short. It can do a lot more. First of all, there is lightning power in that doesn't just charge your iOS device, but also supplies power for devices plugged into it for stuff like USB mics and audio interfaces. And when you are transferring literal files, be them from like an SD card or uh, a USB drive or from your camera itself, you can do so with USB 3 speeds, thanks to the high speed controller found on the A9X and A10X Fusion SOCs. Uh, Lightning being restricted to USB 2 was often cited as the reason that Apple moved to USB-C on the iPhone, but this proves that wrong. Years and years prior, USB 3 existed for Lightning. So, Long story short, I suspect that when the iPhone 16 gets the iPhone 15 Pro's A17 SoC, that USB 3 will come with it. But that SoC is named the A17 Pro. Will they put the A17 Pro with the USB 3 controller on the regular iPhone? Maybe not, but if it doesn't, I am totally going to rail Apple for it because they've had USB 3 on iOS devices since 2016 and they better not get rid of it. Okay, this is the only thing on this list still designed for current generation products, but I couldn't not talk about it. I recently sold my 2019 Mac Pro, like literally weeks ago, which is a shame because I would like to show how these work because I could never justify or afford them but uh, yeah, that's right. It's the Mac Pro wheels. You say, can't afford them. Couldn't just some wheels for some uh, computer. How much could they cost? $700, $700, $699 these things cost. So I'm expecting an amazing unboxing experience. Oh. Okay, we've got this pouch. We've got the documentation and check this out. It's a QR code to learn how to install the Mac Pro wheels. That's certainly with a video. Uh, they included two of them on accident. Well, I mean, I guess they're like $700. <laughs> Might as well give them two QR codes. This is nice paper. Maybe it could have been uh, $698 if they didn't include that. Okay, here they are. You have this beautiful, of course, little cardboard insert here. And there they are the Mac Pro wheels. Oh, I've never seen these in real life. Like, at least not touched them. Let's pull one out. Oh my goodness. It is difficult to state how heavy these things are. This might be almost as heavy as the Apple Vision Pro, which is really, <laughs> which is really heavy. Let's, uh, where do you, oh, here we go. We can unpeel this little cotton right here, protecting the stainless steel that is found underneath. Wow, that's very extra. And then uh, you've also got a little plastic nib here. Okay, let's see how nice these are. Oh yeah, these are super nice. Okay, so this whole 
stainless steel, and it is stainless steel, like massive piece of metal is all one unibody structure. So the only moving parts are this top part, which spins so nicely. Is that friction based? No, there's roller bearings in there, because of course there are. And then each side has its own little rubber, and it's a very hard rubber, but yet it is grippy and soft, um, has its own wheel. What this allows you to do is basically torque vector <laughs> to give you a super, super tight turning radius. Look at this. You could, probably could put a car on these wheels. Um, it is amazing. It is stupid. I mean, these have no business being this expensive. Uh, it frankly should have just come with them. I mean, come on, the Mac Pro's $6,000. What I would like to see is how easy or difficult it is to actually install them. Oh, wow, look at that. You've got a little chuck for a, for a nice impact driver. Uh, probably don't use that, although I don't know, maybe that's what it's designed for because it's got a little impact driver bit here. And then there is, of course, um, a little hex key on the other end that you would use to remove the feet from your Mac. Because this is a professional product, Apple trusts you, the end user, to upgrade something that is found on the outside. But you do have to access the actual screws from the inside. And you might recall from my teardown, it was actually pretty darn difficult to get access to those hex screws. So I would be interested to see if these were actually very easy at all to swap out. I would bet they were kind of a pain in the butt. They offered to do it in store, I believe, for a while if you bought the kit from them. Uh, in any case, these should not be sold in stores anywhere. Not because they're not still functional with the current generation 2023 Mac Pro, they are, but because that computer itself shouldn't be sold, much less the wheels. And $700, I mean, come on, that's just a disgrace. Even though now that I feel them, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> Okay, now on to the most famous one, one everybody will recognize. Yes, it's the 30-pin dock connector cable that is still, shockingly, sold in Apple stores. I say shockingly because this cable is now two generations outdated. Pull tab? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, nice. Okay, this was used in every iPod, save for select shuffle models, every iPhone and uh, every iPad model until Lightning debuted 12 years ago. Lightning is old, which makes this thing ancient. Uh, the iPhone 5, I guess, technically, was the one that switched over to Lightning. This connector is, um, sure, old, but actually really, really interesting. Because the original iPod was only compatible with Mac and actually synced over FireWire 400, a much faster protocol than the USB 1.1 that was found on Macs in the early 2000s. But FireWire 400 was enormous, it was inelegant, and so the 30-pin cable came out in 2003 with the third generation iPod to support not just better uh, charging and syncing, but a bunch of different stuff. So it retained FireWire support. Um, the third generation iPod actually came with both a USB and a FireWire based uh, cable. In fact, I think even the iPod mini did too that I unboxed with Austin Evans years ago, although don't quote me on that. Uh, this thing was pretty cool because not only did it have FireWire, but it also had a serial interface for interacting with the iPod dock. Uh, you could use a remote when the iPod was docked to hook it up to your stereo system. And uh, of course, to handle the audio, it had line in and line out support to go through the dock to your stereo system. Uh, FireWire support in general was actually retained until the fifth generation iPod video released, which utilized new pins for composite and S-video out support. Uh, they also added this authentication chip that only allowed authorized docks and cables from working with the iPod to receive video. But of course, within mere months, that had been reverse engineered by third-party accessories and circumvented. Okay, a few small weird things were added to the remaining pins over the years, like uh, the iPod camera connector that I mentioned earlier, which let you offload photos from your digital camera to iPod. And then when the iPad came around in 2010, HDMI out was added to this amazing little connector. But it did so with the help of some hand conversion circuitry inside the dongle because they were limited on pin count. By the end of the 30 pin dock connector's life, nearly all 30 pins had been assigned to something. But the eight that were originally intended and assigned to FireWire data and power remained unused for the vast majority of this connector's life. 
30 pin was not reversible, right? It plugged in one way and that was it, but it was easy to insert and didn't come unplugged very easily because originally it had locking teeth um, that, you know, you had to depress buttons to actually release. That lasted all through the iPod era until the release of the iPhone in 2007 when this model uh, came out. It launched with a much thinner connector that just used friction-based latches. Um, it was again revised in 2010 and that's what's been done here because they had that old rounded style connector and then in 2010 they made it sharp because that's premium. And uh, so yeah, this cable has probably been sitting in a box for more or less the better part of a decade. Pretty amazing. I miss 30 pin. Do I want to use it now? No, but it was an amazing connector that served its purpose, just like lightning. And now I'm happy they're both dead and we moved on to USB-C, where 3.0 speeds are what we get on every Apple... Wait. Crap. Let me be very clear. Apple's chargers, they're not a good value. And they're honestly not particularly good quality either. They don't use Japanese Rubicon or United Chemicon caps. They just use regular capacitors you'd find in, you know, kind of cheaper products. There are better options out there. But there is one charger from Apple that I kind of like. It's this one. The 35 watt dual USB-C port compact power adapter. That's its official name. It debuted alongside the M2 MacBook Air in 2022. It supports a USB PD 3.0 spec, um, which offers four fixed PDOs. Um, there are two power circuits. It's actually a pretty clever design. Two power circuits that connect in parallel if you have a single USB-C device plugged in. So it, it can offer you the full 35 watts. But if you have split power, it'll actually independently distribute power based on the specifications and the requirements of the device that you've plugged into it. It's a nice charger, but it's uh, it's not gallium nitride, so it's not particularly small. It's incredibly overpriced at $59, and it's only 35 watts, but it's a nice charger. So then what on earth is this monstrosity? Well, hold on. Dual USB-C port, 35 watt power adapter. The specs would suggest that it's the same, but th th that can't be right. I mean, hold on. Are they selling the same thing twice in the Apple store? Yes, they are. This is the international version that works with different plug types. Now, British people in particular go ad nauseum about how great their plugs are, but they're wrong. They're huge, they're ugly, and they're awful. Now, Apple does sell a folding adapter in the UK that's basically the same design as this, the compact, but it's even bigger and it's only 20 watts. At the same price, $60, there's basically zero reason for this to exist at all in the United States. All it does is allow you to remove this, you know, classic part you've seen on your laptop chargers and add an international adapter. And in non-domestic markets, so in the UK, in Europe, in Australia, they just sell this different piece attached to the charger. They don't get the cool one that we have. Again, the UK gets one kind of similar, but it's only 20 watts. There is no reason at all that in the United States, you should be buying this one. It's larger, it's less convenient, it's uglier, it's heavier, it's stupid. I don't honestly know why they even sell it in the stores to begin with, because like... And I guess their argument could be like, oh, well, we sell the travel adapters, and so if you're traveling, you can put that big ugly one from the UK on. No, just buy like a travel adapter and then just, be, you know, be done with it. Uh, don't buy either of these, but if you do, get the Slim Boy model and not this inferior sized plug monstrosity. Also, can I just complain about price really quickly? This thing is $59, which is <laughs> insane for a 30 watt non-gallium nitride dual USB port adapter. But now that I've made friend, fun of all my friends across the pond, let me empathize really quickly with my, my favorite United Kingdomites. Um, because their charger, I believe, is 79 Great British Pounds, which is like $90 for this thing with the different adapter. Why? It's the same thing. This is the same price for the UK version. Well, maybe not, because it's like there's a tiny little bit more metal, but come on. You're screwing over our friends, Apple. The iPod's white earbuds are as iconic as the iPod itself. Literally, entire commercials were focused around these things. The white cable going on the outside of your clothes up to your ears. Wearing these was a status symbol. It meant you owned an iPod. But the reality is that the iPod's classic round earbuds were actually 
pretty garbage. <laughs> well, check it. The first generation iPod shipped with some pretty great earbuds, but quickly, with second generation, they were revised. They still sounded good, they were super uncomfortable, but they, they were fine, and shipped all the way until the fifth generation iPods. Then they were ruined and sounded like total crap all throughout the early iPhone era until 2012 when these got released, the EarPods. And these have been unchanged for basically 12 years. Oh, that's interesting. This is how you know it's old. <laughs> it's not a lid like all the modern accessories, it slides. Oh yeah, because of this cardboard insert. Nice. Remember when you used to get these with your iPhone? In addition to a charger and a case and a dock and a belt clip and that uh, was a different era. There we go. It says EarPods headphone plug. They actually still carry these, not just in Lightning, but they even made a new version for USB-C. These things have been around the block. And uh, well, the shape will look familiar because it's basically the same as the original AirPods. In fact, it's similar to the third generation AirPods that I still have and use occasionally. The inline mic was said to have been amazing. And it makes sense. It's pretty close to your mouth. And uh, it, in many respects, probably sounds better than the AirPods. Here, here's a comparison test against modern AirPod microphones. Okay, the wired EarPods mic does rustle against my beard, but when I hold it like this, well, this is what it sounds like. And this is what the microphone sounds like coming from the third generation AirPods. Holy crap. Honestly, pretty good. They also have an inline volume control, which is fantastic. This was absent in the first generation AirPods and the second generation and the third generation and the AirPods Pro. It didn't come back until the AirPods Pro 2. And uh, it's nice to have here. Now, as for the sound, they sound fine. They actually sound pretty close to the regular AirPods. When released, they were pretty great given that they were included free with an iPhone or an iPod. And then even at $19, they, they're really not bad at all, but they're still $19, which is good, but you can get some absolutely amazing chi-fi for almost nothing. These are the Tangzu One Air that are uh, basically the same price as these ear pods and just absolutely blow them out of the water. So do these things hold up today? N not really, but Gen Z and whatever are wearing these because that's cool or something to not have wireless headphones. I I don't know. But given that a USB-C version came out, it doesn't look like Apple's getting rid of them anytime soon, even though I think that they should. It's raining really hard. How electric, how magnetic. MagSafe 3's return to the first Apple Silicon MacBook Pro was great, but Apple still sells an adapter released 12 years ago in stores today to convert MagSafe 1 to MagSafe 2. The truth is MagSafe kind of had a rocky start. MagSafe 1 used a T-type connector, just like MagSafe 3 does, but there were tons of fraying issues that resulted from overheated connectors. How did this happen, you ask? Well, let's open this box and find out. Oh, there's no explanation. So let me just tell you. These pogo pins aren't just constantly supplying tons of DC power. That would be very dangerous. All versions of MagSafe are basically the same. They're all five pin. These first and second pins have continuity with their mirror pins, which makes the connector reversible. So the outside pins are the ground, the middle pins are the VCC power, and then the central pin, which is smaller than the others, is a one wire serial protocol. This connector is always providing a very low current, low voltage signal at all times through these power pins. It's low enough that when you touch it, you don't feel anything, but it's there. And when it finally makes contact with a Mac, the Mac provides a resistive load, pulling just enough power for just long enough that after one second, the charger flips a switch and the 16-bit microprocessor switches to full voltage on the power rails. It also sends over a charger ID to the Mac with like has a serial number or a class ID, a couple of other data strings. And when the Mac decides that it's happy with the charger. And when it decides the charger is safe, it switches on its own power input circuit and pulls the full load from the charger. And then the charger switches that little green light to orange using that same controller found in the connector. Okay, some of the original chargers didn't have tight enough tolerances on the pogo pins to make good contact before pulling the whole load on the machine. So they would either fault out and just not work, sometimes with some spicy smoke, or they would slowly arc inside until they literally burned up the connector and the laptop end. 
not good. <laughs> These issues weren't widespread, but they existed. And Apple pretty quickly redesigned the whole MagSafe connector to use an L-style connector instead. Uh, it blocked some of your ports when it was in one direction, but it did help seat against the magnetic mating surface better, and there wasn't as much leverage that would pull that connector loose. MagSafe, in its redesigned form, worked great for years, and it was integrated into the Cinema and Thunderbolt displays, as well as other accessories. But in 2012, MagSafe was redesigned to this MagSafe 2 to accommodate the thinner Retina MacBooks. Electrically, this is all still the same, but Apple didn't want to break compatibility with the displays and accessories that they were still actively selling. So they made this, a $10 adapter to convert MagSafe 1 to MagSafe 2. This is completely passive. It's just a magnet sandwich with some pins in the middle. It's pretty cool that they didn't break compatibility with first-gen chargers, but they also never made an adapter going in the other direction. So Apple stores today still sell MagSafe 2 and MagSafe 1 chargers compatible with MacBooks going all the way back to 2006. Pretty wild. And well, that's it. Uh, feels like I kind of wasted a thousand dollars. Look, it's not the worst thing in the world that these things are still sold in stores. It's better to have more things than you need than not enough. At the same time, there are some things that I would very much like the Apple stores to have that they don't. And these things leave me questioning if Apple's really reconsidered their product portfolio in store for a few years now. Well, thank you so much for watching. Please get subscribed. Let me know what your favorite Apple accessory has been in the past, be it in store or not. But most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.